January 1993, the Akatsuki Maru arrived in Japan with a cargo of reprocessed plutonium from France. The ton of plutonium carried by the Akatsuki Maru was extracted from spent fuel that originally came from Japanese nuclear power plants. Japan had shipped the fuel to France for reprocessing. Plutonium is a fissionable material that can be used to make nuclear weapons. One ton of plutonium is enough to produce 100 atomic bombs. Fears that the shipment would only heighten the risk of global nuclear proliferation prompted nations along the proposed transport route to oppose the passage of the ship through their waters. But the Japanese government insisted on keeping the actual route a secret, as well as all other information about the shipment. Japan ignored the protests by other countries and unilaterally routed the plutonium ship through their economic sea zones. Whatever it seems to me, is that it will pass through the island nations of the South Pacific. And the inherent dangers and the hazards attached to this frequent shipping is something beyond our own imagining at this stage. Given the nuclear onslaughts we have already suffered in the Pacific from other more powerful nations which have imposed their policies on us. Between now and the year 2010, over 30 tons of plutonium will be shipped back to Japan from France and England. Plutonium is produced at the very end of the nuclear fuel cycle, but every stage of this cycle, from uranium mining to plutonium production, has taken a heavy toll in human lives. The World Uranium Hearing took place in Salzburg, Austria in September 1992. The hearing brought together people from the former Soviet nuclear test site at Semipalatinsk. Soviet scientists stricken with cancer after they entered the ruins of Chernobyl. Marshall Islanders suffering from the effects of America's hydrogen bomb tests. And indigenous people who have been victimized at every stage of the nuclear fuel cycle. It was an opportunity for nuclear victims from around the world to gather together and testify about the destruction wrought upon their lives and their environments. Since 1985, uranium has been mined from the land of the Havasupai, an indigenous people who live at the bottom of the Grand Canyon in the southwestern United States. We, the Havasupai people, believe that we lived within the Mother Earth, the place of emergence where we come out to the surface of our Mother Earth is within the Grand Canyon area. There we live in peace, in harmony with plant life, wild life, our Mother Earth the water, the air, 
the sun, the moon. These we regard as a relative. The blue green water that you see is going to be contaminated. We use that to drink and feed our animals and to water our crops. As a young person, I was taught by my elders to understand that that is my home and it always will be. And we are considered guardians of the Grand Canyon. And then when I'm growing up, I see many bad things going on all over the world. And I too will continue to struggle, fighting to protect my mother earth and my future to come. The Havasupai filed suit in district court to stop the uranium mining and eventually took their case all the way to the United States Supreme Court. But every court rejected their appeal and allowed the mining to continue. We appealed that decision which environmental quality had given permission to Energy Fuels Nuclear to go ahead and mine. So we appealed that uh, decision, and now we're going through groundwater hearings, making further studies of how uh, uh, the effects, the contamination that's going to be happening in the future. I'm hearing, as I'm here uh, overseas to another country, I'm hearing more and more about the countries here that are uh, putting their money into uh, this ore that's going to be extracted from the Grand Canyon area. Uh, what they're doing, they're hurting the people, the life, the earth, and Grand Canyon is one of the uh, seven wonders of this world. <laughs> Over 50% of America's uranium supply lies buried in the Four Corners area, home to the Havasupai and other indigenous people, including the Navajo, Hopi, Acoma, and Laguna. For years, the United States government has mined and milled the uranium in this region for its nuclear plants and nuclear weapons. Among them, the bombs dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and those tested in the Nevada desert. At the height of the arms race, over a quarter of the uranium in America's nuclear arsenal was mined here. Of this world. Our federal government in the United States is the Bureau of Indian Affairs who helped negotiate these leases on behalf of the tribe in the 1950s. As our trustee, the Bureau of Indian Affairs misled our people. Granted, uranium was still a new industry in the United States, but however, they didn't tell our people the truth. In this area, as I said, over 30 years, uranium was developed from the 1950s till the closing of the last mine, which was the Chevron mine, which had the deep, deepest, uh, world's deepest uranium mining shaft into our sacred mountain. The Grant's Mineral Belt extends from about 15 miles west of Albuquerque to the Arizona border. It's approximately 60 miles wide and 100 miles long. The Jack Pile Mine, once said to be the largest uranium mine in the world, began operations in the Laguna village of Pauate in 1952 and continued for 30 years until it closed in 1982. The blasting damages to our homes was really bad. Um, the time uh, was like at noontime and at 4 o'clock in the afternoon every day. They blasted. A lot of times they were overshooting and nothing, you know, they weren't blasting the ground right. They were just shooting in the air and making the big uh, concussions on our houses.
But as you can see, it, it is an eyesore. And yeah. I don't know why they dug it up. I know why they dug it up, because they needed the energy, but they're destroying everybody else with it. But I just hope that it doesn't happen to too many other places in this world that we live in. And you, you know, it just ruins everything when you have to open up a, something dangerous like that that they don't know what to deal with. And once they open it up, they can't use it no more. It's, 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 use, it's useless. It's, 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 it's sad. But they wanted to take the whole village because they said there was a big mother load of hot ore underneath this village, 1,200 feet down, and that was in 1979 when they proposed that. And the village officers of Pawati said no, and Laguna also said no. Well, Laguna Pueblo almost agreed upon it because the people down below don't live up here, and they wanted us to move in these bigger houses, different area. But our ancestors moved here. Yeah, a long time ago of uh, saying this is where to live. This is a safe keeping place for these people for forever, but not to be dug up. But they wanted to move us and give us these big houses, and different place to live, and money in our pockets. But all that disappears, and then sooner or later, you know, you don't have nothing. You don't have your, your kiva. You don't have your sacred uh, uh, spots where the uh, shrines have been put in place that our ancestors put. And this is where we stand forever until the day we blow away in the wind and be gone. But we don't want to move. We want to live here. But sooner or later, this will all be leveled off. But it's just a bad memory at one time of life, of human, human development or destruction. You know, that could be all there is. For eight years after the mine at Pawaki closed, piles of leftover radioactive waste remained out in the open. The waste is now being covered up, but only by a thin 18-inch layer of soil. This inadequate covering is scattered by the wind and washes away whenever it rains. Greg Lewis, who is a silversmith, attended the uranium hearing with his wife Gloria and their four children. This type of industrial genocide must stop. And as parents, we have a responsibility to our children to make sure that this historic era of uranium development be taught in their schools, because our children are our future decision makers and leaders of our people. I hope the uranium will never be mined again this can only destroy not only my generation, but future generations of Indian children and Mother Earth. Thank you. Um, there's a few people on a kidney dialysis machine, you know. And there was one boy that died from, he was 16 years old, he had leukemia. So, you know, it all ends up to something's going on, but there really was no study to really actually prove the fact that the uranium did that to those people. But we never had those six sickness before until the mine came 30 years ago. And it's been like this for 40 years now. Nearly all the uranium mines and mills in the American Southwest are shut down now. Only two or three remain in operation. The reason is simple, a plunge in the price of uranium on the world market. But the closed mines and abandoned mills are still there, with contaminated buildings and mountains of radioactive waste rock and tailings left untouched. Leftover tailings are even more dangerous than the uranium that was extracted from them. It takes one ton of uranium ore to produce just four pounds of refined uranium, or yellow cake. The rest is discarded as tailings. On Navajo land alone, nine million tons of waste have been left at the abandoned sites of uranium mills.
Today, Native American workers are hired to bury these tailings back in the earth. Early mines were very unsafe and dirty. There was no ventilation at these mines, no safety equipment, no respirators. There was no gloves were provided. They were constantly, they were constantly exposed to radiation, other gases, and smoke from the blasting. The mine water was used for public consumption and often taken home and used for baby formulas. Harrison worked as a uranium miner in Red Valley, about an hour's drive from the Navajo community of Shiprock. This is where the uranium was mined for the atomic bombs that fell on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The abandoned tunnels remain as they were, surrounded by millions of tons of waste rock and tailings. At the peak of the uranium rush, there were over 300 mining concessions operating here. The Navajo families in the village provided some 150 miners who worked in hazardous conditions that exposed them to radiation over 10,000 times the permissible dose. There is a high incidence of death from lung cancer among retired miners, but for many years the links between uranium and the cancers were ignored, and the miners were unable to get any public assistance or workers' compensation. Philip fought for years to change this. His efforts finally bore fruit in October 1990 when the United States Congress passed a law providing compensation to the miners. What we know of right now, there's at least 10 of them that have qualified and they were compensated. And other than that, there's um, at least 700 more cases that was filed and these were uh, cases that have, been, that have been accumulated from the past that have uh, records that were already straightened. Most of them were widows. And um, I understand all these cases are just sitting up in uh, D.C. and they're not moving with it, you know, like the way we want them to be. Miners have found it is extremely difficult to qualify for this compensation. And if they have silicosis or monoconiosis, then they gotta have these. Medical record, their x-ray records, pulmonary function test, the blood and gas study, plus uh, a death certificate if they're deceased, a death certificate, and uh, something that'll show they're Native American that shows they have a census number. Three, two, the Nevada nuclear one. test site is on the land of the Western Shoshone. Continuous testing of nuclear weapons here violates the Treaty of Ruby Valley, which the United States government signed with the Shoshone Nation in 1863. Our treaty did not give any land to the United States, and which lands could and could not be used by the United States. We have never violated this treaty. On the other hand, the United States has violated the very essence of this treaty by testing its nuclear weapons on our lands and people. We call these tests bombs because the purpose of a bomb is to destroy. The hundreds of craters on our lands, the adverse health effects upon our people and wildlife are testimony to this destruction. On October 12, 1992, 500 years to the day after Columbus first landed in America, people from around the world converged on the Nevada test site. They were there to support the Western Shoshone people and demand a halt to nuclear testing. Because we've been prisoner of war for 500 years. Let's not fall into that hand again. Let's not be prisoners for another 500 years. Let's be free people 
to roam our land free and with work everybody with all the living things we are one people so we work together the best i can Reservation in the Grand Canyon were also there to protest the uranium mining. Japan currently has 44 nuclear power plants in operation. 100% of the uranium used to fuel these reactors comes from the land of indigenous people in the United States, Canada, and Australia. The element plutonium is produced whenever uranium fuel is irradiated in a nuclear reactor. Because plutonium is a fissionable material, it can be used to make atomic bombs. Plutonium is an extremely toxic substance. A single gram is enough to cause cancer in one million people, and it has a half-life of 24,000 years. Plutonium was first discovered by Glenn T. Seaborg when he was 26 years old. Dr. Seaborg isolated the element, which does not occur in nature, by bombarding uranium fuel in a cyclotron. The year was 1940. Four and a half years later, plutonium was used to make the atomic bomb that destroyed Nagasaki. This is the laboratory at the University of California, Berkeley, where plutonium was discovered. It was actually um, more like four years or four and a half years uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, we worked uh, very, very fast in those days. Uh, well, my reaction was that it, I was glad to see it bring the uh, war to an end, and that's what it did. The plutonium Japan recently transported by ship from France is supposed to be used as fuel in the fast breeder reactor Monju, now under construction in Suruga by the Japan Sea. I'm glad to see Japan uh, pursuing the fast breeder reactor, which is based on uh, plutonium. Uh, if we're going to have uh, the nuclear fission source uh, play a, an important role in the future development of energy in the world, uh, we're going to have to develop the breeder reactor. The fast breeder reactor is described as the ultimate nuclear reactor because it produces more plutonium fuel than it consumes. Yet France, which was the world leader in breeder reactor development, canceled its program because of the economic and technical problems involved. 
at Rokasho in northern Japan, there are plans to build a full-scale reprocessing plant to extract plutonium from spent reactor fuel. But reprocessing plants, too, have been abandoned in one country after another because of the economic and technological risks they pose. Well, plutonium obviously is radioactive, and uh, if you ingest it, it's, it's uh, not good. But uh, I believe that the uh, claims that it's uh, one of the worst poisons in, in the world uh, uh, are overstated. Uh, actually, almost essentially nobody has been hurt uh, from plutonium so far. And those that have ingested it in uh, the course of their work haven't uh, suffered the ill effects that uh, were predicted. At the uranium hearing, participants described the radioactive contamination around the reprocessing plants at Savannah River and Hanford in the United States and Sellafield in England. Plutonium and other toxic substances have polluted the groundwater and destroyed the health of workers and nearby residents. For 40 years, the Hanford reprocessing plant in Washington state produced plutonium for America's nuclear weapons program, starting with the Nagasaki A-bomb and continuing for the duration of the Cold War. On several occasions, the plant released radioactive materials into the environment, most often accidentally, but at least once in a deliberate experiment. 1949 rerun was a deliberate release. And then somebody in our government made a conscious decision to keep it secret so that none of us could seek health care. Remember the three things about him, twice out of Chernobyl. It was deliberate. And a conscious decision was made to keep it secret from the citizens by his own government. Tom Bailey was born on a farm next to the Hanford plant. He grew up on a diet of milk and farm produce, contaminated with radioactivity. Tom was born with birth defects and is now sterile. Abnormal births and deformities were also common among the livestock on farms in his neighborhood. In the worst year, 80 out of 200 cattle were born deformed. When Tom started to ask whether the same effects might be found in people, his battle was only beginning. question started the discussion and it was a horrible discussion it really wasn't a discussion it was all-out war and the war was to make Tom Bailey look like he was crazy and all the neighbors thought I was crazy but I had asked the question and I stayed with it and as it turned out I wasn't crazy Hanford did do something to the area that harmed people and put them at risk for cancer from 1944 to 1971, Hanford released radioactive gases into the air and radioactive wastewater into the Columbia River, damaging the health of people living downwind and downstream from the complex. Today, the reprocessing plant is closed, but the Hanford site still houses two-thirds of the radioactive waste from nuclear weapons dismantled since the end of the Cold War. It will cost an estimated $60 billion over the next 30 years to clean up the environment and maintain the security of the stored waste. Like Hanford, the Savannah River plant on the South Carolina-Georgia border produced radioactive materials for America's nuclear arsenal plutonium, as well as tritium used in it, hydrogen bombs. And like Hanford, Savannah River secretly released toxic gases and wastewater that contaminated the surrounding area. At the age of 17, I was diagnosed with a disease, drinking from contaminated milk. It was diagnosed as a disease that would take my life by the time I was 35. 
and I am grateful that the Creator has seen fit to use me further because very soon I will be 45. So I have been granted 10 extra years. We know that the scientists say that there is a controversy over the health effects of low radiation. But I'm here to tell you, my friends, along with the others, that low radiation doses is deadly, dangerous, and it causes death. Death through leukemia, death through cancer. I lost my sister through leukemia and my grandmother through cancer. And many of my friends who live in Chatham County suffer from cancer. We, the second largest county in the state of Georgia, has the highest incidence of cancer in our state. The Savannah River site is a classified military installation and therefore exempt from federal environmental protection laws. Either because of structural flaws or mismanagement, cracks have developed in nine of the 51 tanks used to store radioactive waste at the plant. So far, 35 million gallons of waste have leaked out. When the plant was in operation, 200,000 gallons of liquid waste were dumped in open pits every day. Low-level radioactive waste was buried underground in cardboard boxes. This waste has leaked into the Savannah River, which provides drinking water to local residents. It has also found its way into the Tuscaloosa Aquifer, one of the largest underground water reservoirs in North America, which lies directly under the plant. The site was closed in 1988 for safety reasons, but in December 1992, as preparations were made to restart one of the plant's reactors, a leak of highly radioactive coolant forced a shutoff of the water supply for 50,000 local residents. Radioactivity over 10 times the permissible dose was detected in the water. At Sellafield, England, where spent nuclear fuel from Japan is reprocessed, plutonium and other radioactive substances flow into the Irish Sea. From there, ocean currents spread the contamination as far as Scandinavia. Well, the Irish Sea is said to be the most radioactive sea in the world. They release uh, liquid discharges into the sea. They had thought when they first did that, when they first did it, they thought that that plutonium, because it's low level plutonium waste that goes into the sea, would bond with the elements on the seabed, and it hasn't. It's just lying there. There is half a ton of plutonium lying at the end of that pipeline, and they um, say there is a 300 mile plutonium lake around uh, its edge. The incidence of radiation induced leukemia has soared among children living around the Sellafield reprocessing plant. Housewives around Sellafield uh, vacuumed their houses and the dust from, from this was, was analyzed and they found plutonium in those vacuum bags. In other words, houses around this facility had got plutonium in their house from the sea. Radiation is a cause of mutations and mutations are Dr. Alice Stewart, a British scientist who attended the uranium hearing, had this to say about the, the use of plutonium of by Japan. Brought about by damage to the DNA. Uh, as I understand it, this uh, request for plutonium to establish what is the loose phrase of plutonium economy in Japan will necessitate collecting uh, waste products at all levels of concentration I mean, uh, that uh, are free to travel. You'll understand the very high doses are, aren't free to travel. They have to be locked into lakes and things. But um, does this constitute a risk to anybody? Well, of course, there's a certain um, 
risk in the sheer transport. But uh, mainly it will be that if Japan does set up this uh, reliance for all its um, energy requirements on further breakdown of plutonium, they're going to be left with, um, I can only describe it as the contents of a second Pandora's box. Pandora's box was opened when we, mankind, first uh, fissioned, uh, uh, split the atom. And we, the world has now um, become accustomed to tolerating extra uh, radiation from this source. This is going to add to this trouble, and it's going to be concentrated in islands with a very heavy population. So it's bound to have a bad effect. Where I can emphasize this is that uh, it was once thought that provided the radiation was delivered slowly enough to everybody, there would then be no effect at all. That what was dangerous was the sudden explosion. But uh, my work suggests it's exactly the opposite. That if you, the slower you spread the dose, the more effective every bit of radiation is going to be in producing the damage necessary either for cancer or for inherited defects. And therefore, in my opinion, Japan is going the very best way in the world to destroy the human race. At least one scientist believes this plutonium shipment is a sign that Japan has started down the path toward production of its own nuclear weapons. North Korea built itself a reprocessing plant because it fears that Japan will develop nuclear weapons. South Korea was similarly motivated when it announced this year that it would build its own fast breeder reactor, just like Japan. So the nuclear programs of both Koreas stem from competition with Japan. This in turn has a boomerang effect on Japan, where it fuels the argument that if North and South Korea develop nuclear weapons, Japan must follow suit. The real purpose of a fast breed reactor is not simply to breed more fuel. What it really does is take low purity plutonium, which is only good for making primitive atomic bombs, and turn it into high grade plutonium, which can be used in neutron bombs and other tactical nuclear weapons. That is what these countries are planning to do. The end of the Cold War has brought historic changes to the world order. America and Russia have embarked on a series of dramatic arms reductions. Yet Japan remains intent on becoming one of the world's largest stockpilers of plutonium, a policy that will only increase the likelihood of nuclear proliferation. In the face of worldwide trends to dismantle nuclear weapons, what will be the future of Japan's nuclear society? Japan plans to ship plutonium from Europe many times over. If the transport of plutonium becomes an everyday affair in Japan, with shipments constantly moving around the country, ours will become an extremely secretive society. This is already happening, in fact. The government tells us that information about plutonium cannot be made public because it involves anti-hijacking measures or the security of nuclear materials. The result is that the plutonium is transported entirely in secret. At any time, plutonium may be shipped right through our neighborhoods without a word of warning. Then, if the average citizen worries about this and tries to monitor these shipments, 
he finds himself the target of surveillance by the police, who accuse him of being a nuclear hijacker. This is already happening in Japan. The 20th century was the nuclear century. Humanity has paid a high price for its infatuation with the atom, both as an energy source and as a weapon of mass destruction. Yet, despite the cost in human lives, we have continued to build nuclear reactors and bombs. Of all nations, none has pursued nuclear development more vigorously than Japan, the first country to experience the horrors of nuclear war. Today, the public is uninformed of these dangers, and Japan is on the verge of becoming a plutonium state. fire of Pluto that threatens life across the entire planet. How will we answer the pleas of the nuclear victims who gathered at the uranium hearing? Based on our testimonies and experiences from around the world, based on the evidence of damage to our people, culture, economy, land, water and air, based on our respect for spiritual values, beliefs and practices, we oppose the destruction of our existence. We, the listeners, have listened and have heard the testimonies from around the world by the peoples of the mountains, the forests, the deserts, and the oceans, who suffer daily from the uranium mining nuclear weapons testing, nuclear power generation, and radioactive waste. These testimonies show the intimate relationship with the Earth and the destruction of the natural environment they depend upon, culturally, spiritually, and materially. It became clear that each phase of nuclear process, civilian or military, has a deadly impact on all forms of life. We realize that we, the inhabitants of this planet, responsible for the generations to come, have to live with consequences of our radioactive heritage from now on. Together we say, no more exploitation of lands and peoples by uranium mining, nuclear power generation, nuclear testing, and radioactive waste dumping. Clean up and restore all homelands. End the secrecy and full disclosure of all information about the nuclear industry and its dangers. Provide full and fair compensation for damage to peoples, families, and communities, cultures, and economies, homelands, water, air, and all things living. Provide independent and ob objective monitoring of human health and the well-being of all living things affected by the nuclear chain. Further, we say, in view of the unity of humanity and the world, we appeal on behalf of our future generations to use sustainable, renewable and life-enhancing energy alternatives. We call on the whole world, in particular readers and scientists, 
to share in our vision for peace, harmony, and respect for life. Join us. All together, join, join us, us all. When Pandora's box was opened, all of humanity's ills were released into the world. Only one thing remained behind, and that was hope. Can we make this hope our own? That is the challenge before all of us.